It gets better and better every time you hear that song, doesn't it? 0808590693. The Real Sounds of Africa there to once again kick off our world football f- phone in. I am a football fan. I am a soccer fan. I come to see Charlton Athletic do better than they've done for the last few seasons. And this morning we're talking football. In, it's no laughing matter. In this, this morning we're talking football in Europe and South America and players from over there playing in our leagues. And we have got the return of the Colonel, Mina Rizuki, with us covering European football. Good morning, Mina. Oh, that said with such a nice deep voice, Dr. Well, no, I am called the Barry White of late night radio, you know. Some people call me that. And one or two people. One or two people mm-hmm. call me that. And they both it live wasn't on you. my screen. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and we've got the other bloke, uh, the legendino, Tim Vickery, over in South America, in Rio. They're taking care of everything to do with South American football and players from over there playing our league. So good morning to you, Tim. Don, if you are the Barry White of late night radio, then don't go changing. Well, I didn't do the Barry uh, White for it, you, by the way. <laughs> I just thought, no, you know, no, you didn't. Yeah, I, I, know, felt, yeah. I felt very hurt. I just want to make that Anyway, really good evening, clear. everyone. I hope, uh, hope everyone's well this time of year. If you're not, if you're going through a bad time, then hopefully, for, at least for the next two hours, we can line those problems all in a row and then watch them fall like dominoes. Good evening, yeah. everyone. Good evening, good, Mina. Yeah, good evening, good evening. And oh, there is still evening. some unfinished business with Mina to conclude. Do you remember that great night we had a couple of weeks ago, Tim? It was a fantastic I night, do, yeah. Three, yeah, yeah three weeks night. ago. It was brilliant. Yeah. Where was she? And, well, no, I was going to say, nobody was missing. It felt great. You know, I didn't miss anybody. Did you miss anybody? <gasps> I didn't miss anybody at all. That is so mean. <laughs> no, I'm just saying. I'm just saying. It was a perfect night. It was a perfect night. Sometimes you have a lad's night out, you know. I'm not saying that ladies yeah, weren't well, invited. <laughs> Listen, oh, what a night. Early <laughs> December back exactly. in 17. That's the night we're talking about. And mm-hmm. she missed out on that night. But I know I did, I know, I did get all your apologies. You, you had no other choice, I know. And uh, you would have been there with us. You were there in spirit. Uh, you were missed. You were missed. A couple of people mentioned you. And every time we talked... Only a couple. <laughs> well, every time somebody mentioned defence, they said, oh, don't let me hear that. Don't let me hear that. <laughs> I, love that I, know, I know why she was missing. <laughs> Go on, why? Um, I know exactly why she was missing, because she was quaking in her shoes about the draw for the Champions League. Uh, quaking in her shoes she was. Now I was, see the quaking, I was at when. But- she was in I her was, shoes, uh, yeah. She was in her shoes. She, yeah, was, she was quaking all over, more than Johnny Kidd of the Oh, Pirate. I like it. Yeah, that was very good. Yeah, I thought that that's, that's home good. ground for you. That yeah, one. of course. Yeah. You're right. No, I, I, I was right. there at Wembley at the start of August in a pre-season friendly. Yeah, yeah, it's called when the we summer sent them back to Yeah, when we sent them back to Turin to think again, bring on the same thing in a couple of months' time. So that's why she wasn't there. She was, she was a quaking. You, you had me. You had me. But if I'm really honest, it was my parents' 50th anniversary. So. Yeah, that's, that's a good reason. That's a good excuse. Yeah. <laughs> wedding Congratulations to them. Do I say wedding? <laughs> Whenever I say anniversary, people are like, what do you mean? Well, <laughs> I think people get it after a while. Or to get it in any case, an anniversary is an anniversary, I'm sure. Okay, let's talk first of all. There was a question earlier on, by the way, Mina. So I can't find who sent it, but it's about this El Clasico between Real Madrid and Barcelona. To what extent will it now be a political occasion after the regional elections in Catalan a couple of days ago? They will try not to make it um, become one, and it's going to be hosted in Madrid, so... I almost think that it's better to have it there than to have it um, on this occasion in Catalonia, just because I don't know what's going to happen there. Uh, This is sometimes, you know, Barcelona have always said that they are more than a club, and a large part of that is devoted to the fact that they do have a political agenda. And uh, their whole point at the start of this, or at least Gerard Pico, who got attacked a lot for this, was we just have, have a right to vote. It's not saying to you where we stand. It's just that everyone has a right to vote. Um, and he was sort of made the poster child for um, for all of this, which was perhaps unfair. And then he, he suffered quite a lot afterwards. But this is, we have to, you know, there are times when you, you know, you stand for what your political beliefs are, but you are a football club. And, and at the time, you know, Barcelona obviously angered a lot of people when they decided to just, you know, they didn't actually seem to stand with anything at the time, uh, just by not allowing the fans to come into the stadium during that whole ordeal when it was like well what are you really doing why don't you just let everyone play and everyone be allowed to come in 
or take a stand, but choose one or the other because you haven't satisfied, you know, you haven't satisfied either side, really. Um, so I'm sure there is going to be that, but it is in the Bernabeu and it's more about the points, or at least that's what they're trying to focus on at the moment, whether the Zidane side is really good enough to do what they managed to do in summer. But as we like to remind Tim Vickery here, sometimes what people do in the summer doesn't really translate to <laughs> what they end up doing during the season. <laughs> uh, yeah, but, but yeah, I mean, right now they're talking more about, you know, the, the absence of Umtiti, what that will do, whether, you know, whether Messi will ever be applauded or be given the standing ovation that Ronaldinho once was or in, or, or indeed Andres Iniesta. So they're taking different ways to talk about it. What they're also talking about is if uh, Barcelona is able to do the hat-trick against Real Madrid at the Bernabeu, that would have been the first time ever. What, what, the thing is, is that would you say it's deserved? <laughs> Why are you asking me? I don't know anything about it. I should yeah, ask you that. <laughs> um, yeah, well, I guess so. But um, this is what's so interesting because there's some people who are convinced, um, at least Unai Emery was talking about this before he was a PSG manager, and he said, oh, I'm, I'm absolutely convinced that Real Madrid are going to win this Classico. Uh, they're saying, you know, there's just absolutely no way they're going to go all of these points behind. And, and, and you know, now they're, they've won the Club World Cup and they're on a high and as good as Barcelona have been, you know, they're really perhaps not at the levels that they were despite being absolutely sensational against Deportivo La Coruña um, this last weekend. But you know it is, you know it is in the Bernabeu, and it it will be. Perhaps now is not the right time for them to win win it. You you almost want them to win it when they are the very best in their game, you know, like they were a few years back under Pep Guardiola. But you know, obviously, if they do win it, then congratulations to them. I should declare an interest of this next question, Tim. It's from Robel, and and my interest in it is how it starts off. It starts off. Dawson is the greatest radio host ever in block capitals. <laughs> now. <laughs> Well, that's what he says. That's I'm just reading it out. Read this question. I'm, just, I'm just declaring my interest. Now, the question is, Ronald Gino's decision to run for senator in Brazil, uh, I'd like to know what his platform is and how it's been received by the Brazilian public. Well, I, I hope, I, I sincerely hope it's not serious. And he hasn't done a great deal that's serious in recent years. The, the, the political party that he's considering running for, um, the, the, the leading candidate there is... Uh, an extreme right-wing former army captain called uh, Bolsonaro. Uh, the vote, you remember the vote last year when the then president, Dilma Rousseff, was, uh, was impeached? Impeached on technicalities, really. No, no personal corruption charges, but impeached on, on technicalities. Now, during the, the time of the military dictatorship, she was, uh, she was a political prisoner who was tortured. And uh, when the, 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 uh, the, the fellow from this party, Bolsonaro, when he went to declare his vote, vote, he dedicated his vote to a torturer, to the man from the military dictatorship who, who tortured. Now, what kind of pond life is that? And what kind? You know, we are, we are in 2017 for crying out loud. Who would want to associate with that? Uh, and uh, so of all of the things that Ronald, Ronald Jr. has done, the only victim has been himself until he uh, looks as if he might run with, uh, with uh, this, this party. Uh, words fail me in, in, in my disappointment. But how do you explain it? How do you explain it? Is he... I've absolutely no idea. No, I've no, is, no idea. I don't I mean, know is, what is he naive? happens in his, in his head. Is he naive? Yes. Or is he, yes. Is he yes. if you Could like... Be. Is he, if you like, um, yeah. a, a supportive of I the understand. military junta or what? Is well, right wing? I understand the the, right the appeal. No, I don't. I think he, I think he's he's not coming at this from a from a thought out political perspective. On this particular candidate, Bolsonaro, he has a, a great deal of support with young people at the moment, who have no memory of the military dictatorship and uh, are traumatised by the experience of violent crime. I mean, a violent crime is such a huge issue here, and it's something that the poor really suffer from. It's not just. Uh, people with nothing robbing the rich. You know, people, uh, poor people get knocked off, mugged 
all the time. So it's an issue which is traumatizing society. And Bolsonaro appears to have a solution to this, which is just kill more people and lock more people up. So it's a simple kind of solution that a lot of people are going for. That's what they used so to do. So I would imagine... Once upon a time, that was the solution, wasn't it? Once upon a time. Yeah, well... And, it, and surprisingly, it never in seems Brazil. to work anywhere. You know, well, look at the United States. You know, the number of people yeah, exactly that, that are locked up in the United States. And Brazil has a huge prison population. Uh, and you know, it's it's proved time but, and time I again mean, once that, upon that a time, locking up. The, there were death squads going out on the streets, cleaning up the streets. Yes, weren't there? yes. Once upon a time in Brazil. Indeed. So, yeah. Indeed. I think mean, this fellow Bolsonaro is on record as saying that the military dictatorship should have killed thirty thousand. You know oh I mean, that's the kind of person that, that, that you are allying yourself with. Um, so, uh, do you think he actually think holds similar beliefs, or do you think no, he's just... no, no? I don't think he does. Uh, in fact, I, I don't think a lot of the supporters or the people who are who are going into that camp. I mean, there is a, a very active right wing now, and the right wing in Brazil who and there is a place for some right wing ideas. There's a place for for ideas on, on I'm not against uh, I think right wing ideas should definitely be a part of the debate and one of the things that a right wing is tradition what traditions are worth keeping that's a debate the society has to have the right wing in general and the, the left I think has, has always taken yeah, wealth creation for granted you're so, talking about extreme right yeah, though, yes. extreme mm. and, yeah, it difference. really is it really yeah, is extreme yeah, right and, 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 and Bolsonaro that, himself yeah. says that he doesn't really have any economic ideas mm. you know what so, he is, is is a protest vote against let's everything not, that, that, let's that, that's going on let's not to the politics but is Ronald Gino I'm presuming now is Footballing career is over, is it? Can we move on? To he the hasn't next officially chapter? declared it. Okay. Uh, his, uh, his, you know, if someone is going to pay him some money to, to 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 turn up and do something, then he'll do it. Um, but he hasn't played for a while. He just had some very bad news that his brother, and his brother has been a kind of substitute father for him. His brother has been his, his manager and so on. His brother has just had quite a serious health problem. So that that will throw something of a, of a spanner in, in all kinds of works, I think, at the moment. Yeah. But he hasn't officially announced his retirement. The, the reason why he still headlines is because we remember that magic year or two when he was the best thing since mm. sliced bread in it's football. Incredible. And it, it's almost as if... Whatever you do, that year or two lives after you. You know, that it was just a, you know, you just thought, wow, we're never going to see his like again in the footballing field. He was just too good. And, you it's know, funny, I, I, yeah, because you, you've seen some really great players because the only one of the only ones, I think, that ever made you smile when you watched football. Yeah, well, especially when... You were just yeah. so happy especially when you saw, uh, Especially when you saw about eight men from the opposition jump up at a free kick and he passed the ball underneath them. That was, <laughs> that was, that still makes you smile till today when you see that. And he so, just uh, played with this yeah. childlike joy, didn't yeah, he? There was yeah. such joy. Yeah. And, and the, 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 uh, the, the real dilemma, I think, in his career is that he seemed to decide at a fairly early stage that he got more joy than other things than he did from, from playing football. Oh, yeah. um, when, he, when he first came back to Brazil, he, he joined, uh, joined Flamengo, about something like 2011, something like that. Uh, someone who played with him at Barcelona was asked, you know, how do you think he's going to get on? Uh, and he says, well, it depends. I and mean, sometimes he only gets one hour sleep a night. <laughs> and and that, that's, the, that, that's the tragedy of him, is that, yeah. you know, if he'd have left all that to now, you know, now it's he's, what, 37? Yeah, it's a yeah if he could have left all that to now, yeah. he's still got years and years and years know, to, easy to, to enjoy himself. It's easy to say, mate, but when yeah. you're a kid, you're a kid, you know, and some people grow up faster than others, but when you're a kid, you, know, you don't leave the childish things behind, you know that. OK, this question for Mina from Sion. Mina, uh, Sion in Snowdonia wants to know what your views of the current Man City team are. And can they win the Champions League this year? I suppose a lot of them are Europeans in any case, but can they win the... Oh, and declare your interest if you have to. What do you mean, declare my interest? Don't worry, it's a Paul Serra's joke. Don't worry. Man oh, City, right. Paul Serra's declare an interest. <laughs> That's what we always say whenever he comes on. Oh, he does love them, City. doesn't he? Do I he think does. they can win the Champions League? Yeah. I don't know whether it's... I, I definitely, Obviously, I think they're going to win the league. I think the Champions League might be just one step too far for this season. Um, you kidding? But me. having, huh? You kidding me? Champions League. Have, oh, you, you? have you seen how they've destroyed everything in their path? Not least them lot, pesky lot from North London the other week. <laughs> I was keeping quiet. But that was <laughs> in the league. Trying to keep the Champions League. silence. Yeah. Are you, are you saying <laughs> our league isn't as good as the Champions League? Is that what you're saying? No, obviously not. No. <laughs> 
No, but the Champions League is harder than any league. It's the Champions League. No, I, I, I get that. But have you seen the way they've destroyed everything in their path? Everything worth 100 million? Yeah, but that's like saying, well, obviously, if Leicester City won the Premier League, then they should be hands down to win the Champions League. No, that's not the same. That's not the same. They weren't beating people like Man City are beating people at the moment, though, were they? No, I agree mm. with that. Mm. And I do think that... But, but the Champions League is sometimes not always won by the best team either. Sometimes it is a little to do with luck. I mean, when Chelsea won it at the time, they were what the, the best defensive team, but they certainly weren't the best team overall. Um, you could argue that with several cases, honestly, and when it comes to the league, I think Atletico Madrid perhaps deserved it um, at one point against Real. But, you know, this is you don't necessarily, the best team wins in the end. And you never know, maybe they'll have, when you're coming up against Bayern Munich and players that are accomplished and, and experienced and who who know how to win the trophy and, and perhaps a coach who's done it before. Heikes has done it with Real Madrid and he's done it with Bayern Munich. And they are going to be a side that will attack the defence and have better players and ones who aren't just reliant on Dele Alli and, and let's say Harry Kane, then maybe they'll cause more problems or maybe they won't. I'm just saying, I think they'll fight, face uh, tougher Dancing. challenges. <laughs> so don't worry, don't worry. You, you mentioned Dele Alli and Harry Kane. She's just jabbing away. Yeah. Jabbing I'm like, I'm just, away. Ha, have I gone for Spurs a bit hard? Don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. <laughs> I have to say, actually, I, Pochettino I, I, is my favourite coach. I thought that was the correct <laughs> reference, particularly this year. Uh, Dele who, some people might be asking. We've got a call out, Nick in no, Nuneaton. that's unfair because I think... Wait, I didn't even finish. <laughs> oh, sorry, you haven't finished. Bear with me, Nick. Nick, can you wait just a moment or two? Do you mind? Oh, no, Let no, no, bash no, no, Tottenham no, no. a little bit more. Why don't you? <laughs> Hang on, Nick. Nick, are you there? I'm there, Doctor. I'm yeah. not here. I'm here. Do, do you mind just waiting a moment or two? Because no, you know, no, no, apparently, let me go ahead. apparently, no, apparently, it's not. <laughs> it's not over till the Colonel Lady sings. It's, indeed, I'm, I am more than happy to wait my turn, Doctor. Yeah, exactly. Me too, actually. So, you Colonel, know what, Doctor? When ahead. you use that, you're trying to say that I'm a fat lady. <laughs> I know what. Me? God, for goodness sake. Because the actual, You're the colonel. The actual thing You're the is colonel. It's not over till the fat lady no, thing, no, right? I wouldn't dare. I wouldn't dare. Like, like Nick, I know how to behave myself. So, oh, yeah, me. just let us know when you finish. Um, I'm just going to take... <laughs> no. I'm just going to have a sip of a cup of water, OK? Let no, me know I when you finish. <laughs> OK, so I drink a lot of water, OK? <laughs> um, yeah, all I, I don't really remember what I'm saying now. Um all I'm saying is that I think it'll be hard for them to win the Champions League yeah, this season. The last season, thing you I said was Dele Alli wonderful... and Harry Kane. I just said they'll face tougher challenges going yeah, forward. Yeah. You know, I don't think that just beating Spurs makes them the side that are now being, you know, uh, labelled as the best ever English one and perhaps even better than Arsenal's Invincibles. How can we even judge that? It's still December. So we still don't know what's going to happen. We don't know if there's, you know, they're going to fall. At the moment, they're playing sensational football. I'd also argue that at the moment, they don't have that much competition I'm really sorry. I don't. I don't think this is, you know, Mourinho's best ever Manchester United. You know, I mean, this is this isn't a great United side, despite how much talent there is within it. Antonio Conte has a team that doesn't have the squad depth necessary to challenge on all fronts. And you know, Mauricio Pochettino is doing Pochettino is doing the best that he can with the players that he has. But you know, I I want to see a team that's a Bayern, that is a Real Madrid, that is a Barcelona. Well, that is even a Juve that will attack the back line and see what happens. And you know what? Maybe City will come out tops, but I don't think they've yet been tested on that level. Uh, so, Nick, in Nuneaton, good morning. Good morning, Justin. <laughs> yeah, and, and happy morning. Christmas and all of that. Season's greetings, yeah, as it were. Yes, yeah, and to, and to all three of you, yes. Well, yeah, hello, Tim, hello, uh, hello, Mina. Good nice to talk to you again. It's a pleasure. Um, you last time we asked me on Dutton in 2015. Um, it was in, I think it was February. My, I had my daughter when she was three weeks old and I was doing the night feeds. And, oh, yeah. Um, and we had, a, we had a really good chat there and I think it was on for ages because I think I was one of the last callers. And uh, so it's been a while since I've been back. But How is she? How's um, the little one? She's Ooh. fine. She's uh, she's three. She's three years old next next month. Um, she's incredibly excited about Santa. That's that's why I'm still up. I've been wrapping all the Christmas presents. <laughs> tonight, so. Hang on. Oh, don't no. tell me you are Santa. Don't destroy oh, no. my no, illusions, no, no. please. <laughs> no, no. I've been wrapping the presents for Santa. He's going to come. Unless and of course, unless of course you're a bloke with a big white beard. Do not destroy no. my illusions. <laughs> no, I'm not. No, no, I'm just, just checking. <laughs> just checking. I'll definitely that. <laughs> um, yeah, no, in fact, thank you for having me on. Um, I, always, I, I very rarely now get a chance to listen live, so I'm always listening on the podcast. And um, I, I drive a lot for work, so I, I, nothing, nothing excites me more than listening to the podcast when I'm driving. And there's, a, there's, a, there's a question uh, Mina was asked, oh, you probably go back about six, seven weeks ago now, maybe longer than that. Someone rang up and said about um, 
great players don't tend to become um, great managers anymore. Yeah. Some will always have a go mm-hmm. at management, um, but, but they're usually destined to fail. Not destined to fail, they usually don't do very well. And I was I was talking recently with one of my, one of my friends, younger brothers, and he was, I'm, I'm 35, he was, he's a good few years younger than me, and he was saying to me, he was the best player I've ever seen live. And I said, well, I, I'm... I'm an Aston Villa fan, um, so it's only the ones. It's never the ones that play for Villa. It's always the ones that play against who are deemed the best players. <laughs> um, and I say it was Zola. Zola, when I saw him play once, it was unbelievable. The ball stuck mm. to his feet. Mm. Um, and I said, well, if you look at his managerial career, look what happened to him. It was it was awful. And then I was thinking about it a lot more when I was when I was driving, when I was walking the dog. And it just seems to me now that. I don't think the great players get the chance to become great managers simply because the game now seems to move that 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 fast and that um, technical technical ability just changes in, in a matter of years. Whereas, and I was thinking this when I when I spoke to your research first, but Pep Guardiola was was a good player. I, I, I wouldn't say he was great. I think the one that I would class it seems to be a, a, was a great player and has been a good manager. I think he's very much struggling now. It was Zinedine Zidane. I remember him watching mm. him. He was, he was excellent. But, but now he seems to be really struggling. And I, I just think now, I just think great players that were in in the 70s, like, like Cruyff, when they turned to management, the game was still exactly the same when they left it. Now, I, I think it's, it's a, when they retire and they become a manager maybe the year or maybe two years later, like Zidane did, I know he did, he did the coaching. The game has changed that. That that much since they finished playing, that that may be a reason why you don't get the great players that turn into the great managers anymore. Well, I didn't a, know what what Tim or Mina thought. Well, that's a really good new perspective on that question because there have been so many. I don't think I've heard that one before. But let's get a Tim's views first. We'll come on to Mina in a second, Tim. Well, I'm particularly fascinated with, for, with Mina's views here because I think this one is much more for her than it is for me, and I'll explain why. And this idea of the dynamic of change, and I sense that from, from European football, uh, just looking at the articles that uh, our, our best colleagues write in England, you know, that it will be something like, look how the, per, the, the profile of, of a centre-back has changed over the last few years. You know, Now you have to defend much further from, from goal. And, and so there's such a, there, there is a dynamic of change going on there all the time over here. That change just hasn't happened at all. I mean, uh, the, uh, the, the old guard of coaches will still really defensively, most of them, they'll really defensively say, uh, football hasn't changed. No, there's nothing has changed in football in the last 20 years. So there's such a massive difference. And, and in many ways, football over here hasn't. That's club scary. football, I mean, you, scary, you, you, have to make a, you have to make a distinction between club football and national team football. The club football over here, a lot of it really is stuck in time. And, and because coaches don't really have time to do anything, they don't have time to experiment. We just saw he's a coach who's just left his job for reasons that hopefully we'll have time to go into later on. Adil Holland of, of Independiente. Who uh, he comes from a background of field hockey, and you could see in his team, you could see that he'd really been thinking about it, and he brought some of the dynamism of field hockey to uh, to, to football. So you could see different things there. He'd have like three players in his team, all of whom could pop up in the attacking left back position, uh, confusing the the the, the, mar- the 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 opposition in that way, and that really stood out because it was something different. We don't have a lot that's different. We don't have the dynamic of change, so uh, uh, th- that doesn't really apply. And the reason that great players over here rarely go into coaching is because there's no job security and you get you get uh, you know 50,000 people in the stadium insulting your mother so why would you want to do it you know so th- th- there aren't that many these days who are attracted to it some are but a lot you know they can make easier money doing punditry and so on so that dynamic of change is really one for Mina who won't have time to do this before the 2.30 no, news no she will yes she will yes she will yeah, well, will she well, well yeah, yeah, I, yeah I think don't you will don't squeeze me on time well, okay no but the thing is Avaprop will hold <laughs> the news I was trying to rattle on until okay. the news to give no, you time afterwards no, no. Oh. you waffled on <laughs> to the news try? but because Nick and I need to ask a question and we're going to go to Nick Hatfield with the headlines very shortly but first of all though you pick up on that because it's a question that's pertinent, particularly this week, with Mark Hughes being under the kind of pressure he's under as Stoke manager. Great player, once upon a time. Football has changed very much since he was centre forward for Man United and for Chelsea, wasn't hasn't it? Are you asking me? 
Yeah, we're still counting the clock, though. You take your time. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, look, I can't honestly, I can't talk to you too much about Mark Hughes. It's not something that I'm going to be that good about. But for me, what we talked a lot about this when it comes to how defense has changed, thanks by and large to what Guardiola has emphasized with his with his type of philosophy and what he's changed about football. I think, you know, we have, you know, in Italy, we view it as sometimes it depends on your position that makes you a better footballer, where what you can see right ahead of you, what you can analyse in front of you, the type of player you were. Um, if we take two examples, you have people in Zaghi and then you have his brother Simone. Simone, from a young age, wasn't as good as people because he was more interested in how everything moved as opposed to how to use his own talent and his own skills to be the very best. So sometimes it's almost like... Uh, Whereas if you if you contrast that to Antonio Conte, a reason why he's such a good manager was because he used to he knew he wasn't a great player, so he had to continue to find ways to provide for the team and become a valuable member to see you know to see it change. The problem is is that when you have somebody who comes in and changes football like Arrigo Saki did with Total Football, like Pep Guardiola has done with his type of football, things it, it kind of throws a spanner in the work. Everything becomes a lot more beautiful. But it almost seems like if you don't follow in line, you either haven't evolved well enough um, and then therefore you become extinct or you then have to create something that's just as good that can counter attack, uh, that can counteract that. And then this is where the problems lie. So Giorgio Chiellini has come out and said about the fact that he thinks Pep Guardiola has ruined defending. And this has been a huge topic in Italy because he said now we have just created a bunch of teenage you know, players who are, or even younger than teenage, who are 12 and 11, who are watching Pep Guardiola's Barcelona, Pep Guardiola's Bayern, and now Pep Guardiola's Manchester City, and think that defending means delivering the perfect pinpoint long ball forward. And he, and he was saying, or, you know, to the side or to the flanks, they don't have an idea what to do when it comes to man marking, when it comes to stepping up a line, how to hold the line, how to push the team forward, how to push the team back, how to really have authority. And he said, and for me, we can talk about how much Pep Guardiola has done for the attack, but for me, I think he's ruined defence. And he made a great point in that because we don't necessarily have these youngsters anymore that care about defending. They want to play for Pep Guardiola. They're mesmerised by that style of play and they're teaching themselves to be these types of players. When it comes to, you know, good coaches or good players, you know, you have to have a philosophy and you have to want to implement that. Um but I, I think that at this moment in time, you know, if if you are somebody who was so good at what it is that you did, then you tended to rely more more on that than opposed to watching what every single moment. It depends. I mean, I really don't know. Or sometimes you just become, what is it that they said with, you know, um, Arrigo Saki? It was almost that he was, well, he, he was a great coach. You know, not, oh, Fabio Capello was a great player. I'm trying to think of really good players who actually made it. <laughs> Yeah, where were we uh, in the world for more phoning? I think Mina um, was giving us all the shakes and telling us about Arrigo Saki. Uh, do you want to pick up from there, Mina? Colonel, are you having a drink of water? Oh, sorry, I realised I put you on there. <laughs> oh, no, you didn't do that again. <laughs> I did, no, I did. <laughs> no, 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 no. Look, it's just so that you guys don't have a go at me when I have my espresso. <laughs> you, did, we, we just played yes. Johnny Kidd and the Pirates, shaking all over for you. I know, I was listening. I just, I, I just you know, you can hear me, that's all. I, I heard it, it was very nice, thank you. Yeah, okay. So, <laughs> so um, back to what we're, yes, I'm like we're, of you we're talking about managers, and particularly managers that, um, well, uh, the, you know, footballers. Well, they, so you were great, great yeah, footballers, I mean, not making great managers. Tim just tweeted out saying, you know, he thinks Cruyff is the great exception. I remember at yeah, the time, I think that. I said that. I that. He needs to pay attention in class. 
Sort of <laughs> well, it wasn't but I guess without waffling on too much, I think what makes a great coach... You never if you waffle. Were a good if I may say so, you never waffle. Oh, no, that, I that other bloke me. I just over... think I waffled no, right no, now. No, no, no. The bloke in South America, yeah, guilty as I charged. I waffle more than a Belgian. <laughs> <laughs> I am not going to laugh at that. I'm not... That is a stereotype <laughs> that I'm not going to laugh Ooh. at. That's it. Pathetic. Even though it's good, juvenile. I'm not, not going to laugh. At that. <laughs> I'm not laughing at that. Anyway, go on. <laughs> Sorry, Mina. Go. On. I said without waffling too much. What I'm going to say, I think you know, obviously, great. You know, it's nice to have a player who's actually played the game, and and you know, um, but a few of them have turned into something. But for me, I think what makes a good manager, it tends to be where they played when they were football players. So I've noticed that midfielders, I think, make the best coaches. Uh, they they are the ones who tend to, ha- you know, when you have like if you divide the pitch into three, you know, you always say that the forward line is a lot based on talent. The defense is based on hard work, excellent tactics and, and teachings and, you know, the ability to absorb instructions and work as a unit. And the midfield relies more than anyone on great intellect. You know, it's the vision, it's watching what, how everything is to know which gaps to exploit, which paths to deliver, when to hold on to possession, when to transfer. And so I feel that if you are a great midfielder, then you have that bit more of a chance to be a great coach. And even if you look at, you know, like we said, Zinedine Zidane, uh, Fabio Capello, Carlo Ancelotti, they were all midfielders. Ancelotti was one of the best, actually. Um, and those are the ones. And even if you there was, a, you know, Antonio Conte, Paolo Sousa, who's not a great coach, but, you know, Didier Deschamps, all midfielders, all, you know, that's the position that they learned. And, of course, Pep Guardiola. Uh, May I just ask that nobody mentions waffling again on this programme because I cannot get the image of a certain nation in Europe out of my mind. (laughs) So no more... No more waffling tonight, please, because I'm going to um, increase... Our... Anyway. Can't guarantee that, but we'll do it. Please, yeah. Uh, how does Tim rate... Is it Romero Gamera from Huracan? Gamara. Gamara. Gamara, Gamara from Huracan. Oh, okay. uh, he went to um, uh, Bill in New Jersey's hometown club, the New York Red Bulls. Uh, or they're about to sign him, maybe. Yeah, the Argentine like midfielder. Very talented. Yeah. Very, very talented. And this is a key trend. This this trend has been going on for the last two or three years of talented young South Americans going not straight to Europe, but going to Major League Soccer. And it's a trend that has gone through the roof now. And Gamara is... is is one, he's a little bit wild. I think he, he needs to be brought under control a little bit. Um, but he's got real talent as an attacking midfielder. And it seems to be that kind of player who's doing very, very well in, in, in Major League Soccer. Kind of Argentine attacking midfielders and playmakers who uh, perhaps they don't have quite enough about them to, to do it in Europe. Um, but they seem to be ruling the roost in, in MLS. Uh, and Ezekiel Barco, the 18-year-old from Independiente, who's just going, uh, going to Atlanta, really, really talented. And a, a couple of Paraguayans as well. Look, a couple of young Paraguayans, it seems, are on their way up. Uh, Jose Coleman uh, from Cerro Porteño is, uh, is uh, heading for one of the clubs in the MLS, who's a, an interesting right-sided midfielder, good passing player, quite slight of build and doesn't have express pace but technically gifted and a good passer. And another one who's, who's, gone to, uh, who's going to, I think, New York City. Um, you know, the, that uh, Man City have a tie-in with uh, Jesus Medina, who's a really talented left-footed uh, Ita- um, uh, Paraguayan uh, striker. Kind of winger, stroke striker, stroke attacking midfielder. He's got a lovely left foot. So uh, hopefully, you know, uh, New York City fans can enjoy a little bit of cold Medina. But th- th- this is a real trend. And, and where this is leading... I think could be very interesting. You know, if, if anyone saw, you know, I, I even doubt if, if Mina bothered watching it, you know, the, the, the Club World Cup recently that, that Real Madrid uh, won. They beat Gremio of Brazil on, on Saturday. It was 1-0. And Gremio, I don't think that they played a particularly bad game. And, uh, you know, they, they, they fought and they left with their heads held high. And they said, well, you know, we took on Real Madrid on equal terms. And at that point, you've you got to take that with a pinch of the old proverbial salt because uh, Real had 20 shots 
seven on target. And, you know, they were only in first or second gear. They could have scored seven, I think, really, if they really wanted to. Uh, Gremio didn't have a single shot on target. Uh, this is the South American champion. Not a single shot on target. There was one shot off target, a free kick that went over the bar. And this, this is the champions of South America. And this is, you know, aside from Brazil, and you go back 10 years, you know, Brazil was enjoying an economic boom while, while uh, Europe, especially Southern Europe, was in crisis. Brazil was staging a World Cup, and so many predictions around there at the time was that, you know, Brazilian football at least, if not the rest of South America, is soon going to put itself on equal and parity with European club football, instead of which the gap just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And that's the real problem for the, for the Club World Cup, and it's a huge problem for South American football. And these days, the South American champions are not really noticeably better than the champions from any, any of the, the, the other continents. So the fact that you've got, a, you've got a, a, a major league soccer in the United States getting stronger and stronger and stronger and more consolidated and in employing South American talent as well as talent from all over the world and you get Mexico there in the middle um, I'm increasingly becoming behind the idea of some kind of Champions League for the Americas I've always been a little bit against it because and the Americas are huge and the, the distances involved are absolutely vast and you're talking mega mega journeys but as time goes by, I just don't see any other solution. You know, I think having a, a kind of a rival pole here from North America all the way down to South America is the best chance we have, with China as well growing, but it's the best chance we have of having some kind of rival pole to Europe. Go cooling at the bar, and I'm looking for some action. <laughs> but like me, Jack has said, that. I can't get no satisfaction. <laughs> I knew him, you know. I knew. I, I used to Jerry. know. No, Tom Loke, he used to live uh, down the road from me in Los Angeles on Olympic Boulevard. Spent a couple of days with him, actually, and uh, and his dog. Yeah. Uh, any any wild do things going <laughs> on there? <laughs> <laughs> Trust you to get to that. <laughs> what happens in Los Angeles stays in Los Angeles, especially <laughs> when it's got the wild things. Thing about it. Um, yeah, thank you for that. And don't, again, mean it doesn't have a clue what we're talking about, but that's okay. That's okay. Uh, she can remember. She can have Tone Loke, surely. I mean, Johnny Kidd on the Pirates, she's going to struggle. But yeah, Tone Loke, no. no. I don't think she does, you know. I, I think she's of that generation. Cold Medina. No, funky Cold Medina. Do you know? Do you know about it, Mina? No. I thought not. 0808 590 Will somebody cheer Mina up because we keep making all these musical references? Is there any reference from her generation that you could weave into a question for the World Football phone in, please? A musical reference from her generation so that me and Tim don't uh, keep going on about, you know, the dark ages of music <clears throat> when music was great, if you know what I mean. 0808 590 Are you saying it wasn't great in my generation? I never quite yes. said that. No. You can interpret I what I said are. in that way. Read between the lines. <laughs> yeah, just... I think we probably are. <laughs> I think so, too. <laughs> well, indeed. Um, lots to talk about. Lots to talk about. Not least... Um, did, you, did, you, did you see the Club World Cup, Mina? Did you bother with it? No. Absolutely not. It was just yeah. going to be easy for them, so I just didn't even watch it. Mm. Hello? That says a lot, doesn't it? It says a lot about yeah. the Club C World case, Cup. Case proven. Mina. Yeah, exactly. I did. I did watch their first match, though. I don't know. Don't ask me why, but I did watch that one. You know, I've against got, Al against uh, Al Jazeera. Al Jazeera. Oh yeah, I've got to declare another interest, though. <clears throat> you know, as yeah. well as me being the greatest. Uh, what was it? Greatest radio host ever. I've got Have they had my podcast? I'm just kidding. Yeah, you see, that's the thing. <laughs> podcast is not the same as being a radio host, is it? You know, I'm, I'm sorry, oh, girl. Yeah. All you know, right. Podcast is a podcast. <laughs> you are no doubt the greatest podcast host ever. It's not the same thing. Anyway, yes, yes, that is anyway, true. It's this not is, a live show. This is uh, now you can't challenge me on this one. Hint, hint, nudge, nudge, wink, wink. A nudge is as good as a wink. Uh, University Challenge Captain Dawson. Dear Dawson, University <laughs> Challenge Captain. I've declared my interest already, Tim. As a long-time listener, but for, and also this is important. That part is important. That's not just some random mention of how great thou art 
This is oh, an no, important. It's a really important uh, part of this uh, email. So, just, as a long time listener, but first time emailer to the World Football Phone, you know, I just had to share my excitement at discovering the referee appearing on a Christmas episode of University Challenge from 2015, as pictured below, looking rather intense and intelligent. Naturally, yeah, looking but not being. That's another mm-hmm. anyway. And this leads to my question for you, esteemed experts, if I may: Have any reasonably high-profile players or managers in the experts' respective regions gone on to notable television appearance or perhaps more interestingly, successful careers in television, film or stage outside of football. For example, Eric Cantona, former French international footballer, of course, and now screen and stage actor. Well, how about Dotson's fellow Nigerian Dion Dublin? He's not a Nigerian, is he? Anyway, mm-hmm. former English footballer who had spells with several clubs, including Norwich City, Manchester United, Aston Villa, etc., etc., etc. So time for Tim's infamous Midlands accent that got me into trouble earlier um, <laughs> with my uh, co-host uh, or my fellow host, Adrian Goldberg. Do you want to do it? No, no, oh, I think okay, I'll okay. stay clear for a while. And my I'll stay villa- clear even when Nick was talking about being a Villa, villa fan. I know, so, you know I, I, I noticed that. I noticed let's that. Let's keep the discipline up. Yeah, and my beloved Glasgow Celtic is now hosting uh, BBC's Homes Under the Hammer. That's what he's doing nowadays, Dion Dublin. Yeah, indeed. Oh, don't know if that was a good career move. Anyway, which for those overseas listeners may be unfamiliar with, it's a British factual renovation and auction television series. Anyway, so mm. in your respective regions... Oh, he wants you to do this in Scottish. He says, best wishes to one and all for Christmas and New Year. As we say in Scotland, lang may ye lum reek. Do you want to do it, Tim? In a Glaswegian no, I, style. I don't know. <laughs> no, I, I don't really get my Scottish. Doesn't really get me on. Aye. That's no, no. <laughs> no, that, about as much as I can do. It's good though. You're aye. It's very aye. good. If I might say, this is from Stephen <laughs> in Bonnie, Scotland. In any case, so in your regions, any football has gone on to either illustrious, or perhaps not so illustrious, TV careers at all? Uh, non-footballing careers, Mina first. What about? Julio Iglesias, he was a goalkeeper yes, in Real Madrid's yes. youth system. <laughs> and then he obviously became Julio Iglesias. Wow. That one. That's not a bad one. Nobody's going to beat that tonight. Brilliant. That's not a bad Brilliant. one, of course. Um, yeah. And there's George Weir, who ran for president well, of Liberia. We're still waiting to know whether he's going to become president or not. They're just having a runoff next week, and hopefully we'll know sometime in the new year. It takes the, They take their time in Liberia, but yeah, you're right. George Weir, that's not a bad girl. I, I think she's trying to... I had Eric tonight. Cantona. What about yeah, Vinnie Jones? Yes, Vinnie Jones, yeah. no? Yes, absolutely. Vinnie Jones, yeah, as well. Um, Chelsea. Played cricket worse. against him. Did you? I did, yeah. Just before he made it, he was with Wealdstone Town. Just before he made it, as a. As don't tell me, he bowled you. Soon before he went to Wimbledon. Yeah, he bowled no, you. No, he, uh, he dropped me off his own bowling. Uh, oh. And that's why, the only reason I remember it. But I, I remember him being the life and soul, and you could see there was just something around him, you know, just something. We, we, we grew up, we're, we're the same age from, from pretty much the same place. Uh, so I know people who played football with him, you know, people who played much better than I did, and so on. Uh, and so, uh, good luck to him. I'm always, uh, I'm always delighted when I, when, when, I, when I see him in a film, you know, because uh, he's come a long way. Um, from, from my neck of the woods, what, Diego Maradona. Uh, he had mm-hmm. a TV show, and he was, he, he was really good as a presenter. And he's obviously, you know, spent so much of his life in front of cameras that he's just totally unfazed, just totally natural. So uh, he was a he was a really good uh, TV host with his own with his own show. He had um, remember Argentina's goalkeeper from the nineties, Sergio Goicochea. He was kind of helping him out, and he, he's, he's done he's done plenty of uh, plenty of kind of uh, non football TV work as well. Um, but in in general here, we're we're in the the, the fairly early stages of uh, footballers being allowed, if you like, to go on and do other things afterwards in, in, in media, being allowed to go on and do things outside, specifically football. And do you remember Jimmy Greaves a few, you know, a few decades ago? Yeah, yeah. When uh, he, he was coming back from his alcohol <laughs> problems and so on, oh. and uh, he first made his name in media doing, uh, being a TV critic. Um, so, you know, he was allowed to, to get into that and, 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 and make a name for himself uh, with something that was a little bit removed from football. And then he kind of blew it a little bit by predicting uh, in the group stage of the 1982 World Cup that Italy were going to win it. 
Um, you know, when Italy were drawing their three group games and everyone was saying, oh, Italy, Italy, uh, they're, they're rubbish. You know, Jimmy Greaves said, you know, you watch out, I think Italy are going to win this thing. Uh, and, uh, and they did. Uh, and so he got stuck back in, in, in football. But he was, he was making a name for himself outside football, which I thought was interesting. Then you had Hoddle and Waddle as well, of course. Do you remember that? Yeah, I, I'm, I've been trying to forget ever since. You know? yeah, don't worry. <laughs> it wasn't very good, it's was just, it? Just yeah. when you said and round see, your neck of the woods, I thought I'd remind you. Yeah, I mean, just uh, the, the big weakness in their, their singing career, Oddle and Waddle, was that the lyrics of Diamond Lights never included in any, in any moment. They didn't include the words Costa Rica. Had they done that, That's that really would have taken off. Yeah, of course. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we, we can, of course, dig it out. Of course we can. Of course we can. Costa Rica. Um, <laughs> do you... Do you, Alan Smith, former Arsenal uh, forward, though, striker, he's done a really good job. I mean, he's a proper footballer. What's he do? He's a journalist, isn't he? I mean, he's a TV pundit yeah, sometimes, yeah. but he's more... He started off... I mean, when he left, when he retired, I suddenly saw him writing for the local paper up north, you know, up north London, uh-huh. as I'd call it, and he, I was, like, surprised. He wasn't, like, writing for the big boys, he was writing for the local... And learning his trade... And he's right. a really good news journalist because, of course, sports can be news as well. And I have a oh, lot brilliant. of respect for somebody brilliant. who actually that's, went that's down. That's terrific. Yeah, yeah he, he did do his training. Good for him as well. He's from the Midlands as well, but I've, don't do I, the accent. I ran into him in, in, in a press box um, a few years ago. And I said, uh, hello, Alan. When you played for Arsenal, I, said, uh, I, I stood on the terraces and I said lots and lots of things about you. And I would like <laughs> to take some of them back. <laughs> And he laughed, and I thought that was great. So, yeah. you know, <laughs> he won me over. <laughs> it's, it's like me bumping into Martin Keown at Five Live. And I said to him, look, I'm not a gooner. In fact, I hate you gooners, yeah, but... And that's exactly what I said to... What's his name? When I bumped into him at uh, Monaco Airport. Uh, not Monaco Airport. Um, M- nice Airport. What's his name? Um, Guna with the long hair. Back in the days of Thierry. Ray Parler? No, no, no. French. Long hair. Emmanuel, Emmanuel Petit. Yeah, that's the one. That's the one. That's, the one. that's the one. Yeah, that's the one. Oh, here, here, here's a song for you, Mina. This is from Matt in Guangzhou. Uh, with your Italian roots, he says, how about, mm-hmm. what's the matter, you, hey? <laughs> Show me no, no respect. What do you think you do? Why you make us all sad? It's the football phone in. It's a nicer place. Uh, shut up for your face. Oh, uh, shut up your face. Dear, uh, dear. <laughs> At this, even, One more time for Mama. Even as I read it out, I feel no. This ain't. This ain't. Okay. This ain't too good, is it? He, I think he was Australian, wasn't he, Joe Dolce? I think he might have been actually. Yeah, I think he might have been. He got away with it. I'm not sure he can get away he with did. it nowadays. <laughs> no, not these I days. Don't, I don't think I could get Why? away with but it. But you said. But you said music got worse. <laughs> Yeah, yeah good very point. good point. Good point. Yeah, she's, uh, <laughs> I think she's trumped <laughs> both of us on that, man. I didn't think you could be so yeah. funky cold, Medina, Mina. <laughs> uh, she, she's yeah, made us both shut up on our faces. Yeah, yeah. Shut up your yeah, face. Shut true. up your face. OK, this is a phone-in. Oh, there's another one as well. Um, no, let's leave that one. So, uh, what makes a good... Oh, we did, co- oh, we did have um, Gaddafi's son play for Udinese and Sampdoria. Mm. Wait, was it Zandori or just doing the music? Yeah, I, mean, he went I think on you're right. I think you're right. Politician. One of Gaddafi's sons. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. John in Salford says, "What makes a great coach?" Then, what actually makes a great coach? Mina, my opinion. Mm. <sighs> a lot, to be honest. I, you know, how everyone always says, or at least it's all about the players, and that you know. I, Massimiliano Allegri said, you know, as long as I don't do too much damage, then I'm doing OK. But really, a win is, is created by the players. And I was on my way the other day to CNN. And I was chatting to um, to the driver for, for Addison Lee, and he was telling, he's a huge United fan. And we were just chatting about it. And he just said, oh, you know, I think Mourinho is the best coach in the world. I don't, I don't think Pep Guardiola comes anywhere near him. It's just that he doesn't have a good squad. And I said, oh, you see, I think that it's, almost, I don't know, 60, 65% about the coach and the rest about the squad. And I know that sounds ridiculous, but I've always believed that a coach is the most important thing within a team. And to be a great one, I think you have to be tactically adept, but versatile, um, unless your your philosophy is that good that you can always rely on a plan A. I think to be a great tactician or to be a good manager, you should be able to play different styles and be able to modify it depending on the players that you have. 
Um, and I think you need to be a good uh, motivator as well as communicator. So I, don't, I think you fall into three categories, right? You're either a builder in the way that Anieri was or a perfecter in the way that Mourinho is or a guy who implements a philosophy. You've got to be everything, I, I, haven't you? You've got to be everything. All things to all men, yeah. as they say, yeah. Come on, Tim. Sing along. No, I don't remember the lyrics to this one. Sorry. I just remember they don't include Costa Rica. I mean, it's enough to make you want to support the other lot in North London, isn't it? Not <laughs> <laughs> bad. No, it's not good. Yeah, it's not good, it's is not it? Good. It's not good at all. And talking of other careers that footballers have had, a sportsman with alternative careers. Steve Highway of Liverpool in the 70s used to model for Grattan's catalogue, um, Steve in Lee Green tells me. And also, um, of course, um, surprised that you haven't mentioned Mick Shannon, says Max in Drumfield, who, of course, went on to be a successful racehorse trainer, amongst mm. other things. Yeah, you forgot about him, didn't you? Anyway, and just to remind too. us of one more that you've all forgotten about, Bri uh, particularly you, Mina, it's in your neck of the woods. That's his two, sir. Brian in County Carlo yeah. in Ireland is with us. Good morning. Hello, Tom. this is Brian. Hi, Ooh. mate. Good to meet you. Uh, you, f you forgot about John Paul II, the Pope. Yeah, I didn't forget about yes. him, but Mina, it's not my region, know. it's Mina's region. He was a goalkeeper in Poland, he which had become Pope. In Krakow. Yeah. In Krakow, yeah. How could yeah. you forget that, Mina? How could you forget? I know, my bad. Yeah. Yeah. My bad. Is I mean, is the Catholic sorry, is the Pope a a goalkeeper? <laughs> What's the answer to that one when people ask? <laughs> 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 well no the trouble is very few people knew about his sporting activities. He was also a famous skier. Mm, mm. Really? Yeah. I didn't know that part. And he's a mountaineer yeah. as well. Oh, but I do know that he loved his football. He did lo love his football. I mean, football gets in all sorts of nooks and crannies, doesn't it? Uh, as, as does the current Pope. I know there, is, there are no yeah. records, I think, of uh, the current one as a player, um, but a, a fanatical supporter of, of, of San Lorenzo. Mm -hmm. And I remember when he, when he became Pope, uh, a San Lorenzo coach of about 20 years ago, he went absolutely pale white because he remembered, oh, God, it's that priest who used to want to come into the dressing room before the games. And I used to spend all of my time trying to kick him out, and now he's Pope. I'm going to hell. <laughs> um, but... <laughs> there you go. It's like, it's like it's a bit of prayer never did any harm for a team. Oh, it doesn't do any harm. But d does, I... the, does the religious person not have to justify their their love of the game, their other... Uh, other people within their oh, well, I, denomination might seem as uh, see as somewhat, you know, not not worthy, not seemly. As I mean, he's the Pope of the Pope. He's, all, he's also an ordinary human being. Yeah, you say that, but then the Rastas, you know, Rastafarians, when they had to justify why they love football so much, you know, they had to come out. You know, Bob Marley had to say, "Well, you see, the football." It's like the world. It's round like the world. You get me? I say you have to take care of it. You have to take care of it. And other people try and take the world off of you. You have to get the ball. You have to get the world from them. And every now and then you have to lick it into them go mouth. You know, something like that. I'm sorry yeah, to Jamaicans, but that's more or less how yeah, Bob Marley said it. Yeah, but John Paul became a saint after, a few, few years after he died. Yeah. And he's now probably one of the most best-known popes ever, ever, ever in the world. Mm -hmm. That's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ever, yeah. It's the only one that we remember that, in living memory. You know, really. I suppose. Yeah, yeah. More. Or less. Yeah, but it, and it all started when he was born in 1920. His father, his father was very ill, mm. so he was. So his life, his yeah. son died when he was only 21. Yeah. And during the, during the Second World War, he he was kept alive by by Jews. Mm. You know an awful lot about him. So let me ask you a question. Um, 
Was he a fan of the four four two formation, or did he prefer this? <laughs> mo- no, I'm serious. Did he prefer all this modern know, three I, three I one four three on kind of stuff? On his life, yeah? I've read a couple of books on his on his life and what what he went through during during the last war. Yeah, and uh, how 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 he built up the Catholic religion. I, I know, Poland. but unfortunately, this is the religious phone, and I was just thinking about focusing <laughs> on his football for a moment or two. <laughs> But well, if, if we want goalkeepers, he, he an ordinary, then the... an ordinary man who just played in the goal. Uh, yeah, yeah. For the, for the sport of it. But I suppose, Tim, yeah, you're about to say that if he's a goalkeeper, then it's more about the defence, isn't it? In front of him, yeah. that he'd be he'd be interested yeah. in. Yeah. Well, he's, he's in good company because defense. Albert Camus was a, was a goalkeeper as well. You know, the uh, the, uh, the philosopher, yeah. the great French novelist. Yeah, yeah. yeah well, so, I uh, him a there's, 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 a, there's a few around. Yeah, L'étranger, L'étranger was the one that he did. did he goalkeep for Algeria because he was an Algerian, wasn't he? Of sorts, wasn't he? Yeah, no, I don't, I don't, don't think he was that good. Like that. He wasn't that good. Okay, yeah. Um, but when he said when he when he came to Brazil, that was the way that he just made an instant connection with with people over here. He just mm. talks about football. Uh, and that, that, that's a role that the game plays so much, isn't it? Just forging international friendships, which is something that we should celebrate at this time of year, I think. Yeah, Brian, thank you very Aww. much. I really do appreciate that as well. You know, uh, didn't, all... Bob Marnie, didn't Bob Marnie play football? No, he, he never played professionally, but he was a good footballer. Do you know, um, mm. there's only one person on Five Live who's played against Bob Marley, and it wasn't me. It was Danny Baker. Uh, played uh, really? when Bob Marley came over, I think it was 77 or thereabouts, the press, uh, d- uh, the Island Records mm-hmm. decided to arrange a kind of a football match between the Dreads and the Ballheads, as it were. The Ballheads were all the journalists, including um, Danny Baker, and they went and played over by, uh, was it um, over in Wormwood Scrubs, you know, over there, not in the prison, but out in the fields out around there, as I seem to remember, yeah. And I I, no, I interviewed one guy who played for Bob Marley on his team in that guy. The guy used to run um, Dub Vendor Records, the one in Labrick Grove, not the one in the original one in Clapham Common. And it's a guy called Red. And he said, yeah, man, Bob was a good footballer. You know, you couldn't take the ball off him. Midfielder, you couldn't take the ball off him. And I said, what, was that because he was skillful or because people knew that if they broke his legs, they'd have to pay a lot of insurance because, after all, he's a <laughs> big-shot artist. He said, no, man, he was a good footballer. <laughs> so, and he used to manage a team in Jamaica called a House of Dread, is what I know. They're all dreads. Oh. Yeah, yeah, apparently. Uh, now, uh, We did uh, forget about Gabriel Batistuta. Oh. He became a polo player. That was quite interesting. This is true. This is I true. don't know. I, did, it, did he last? As a I don't know how long he did it now, but... Batty Stuta, well, uh, that's Tim's region. Batty yeah, Gold is not very long. He's, 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 got, he's got quite uh, bad health problems, bad uh, problems with, with mobility in his legs. So I don't really? think he lasted very long as a polo player. Yeah. Oh, gosh, man. I'm yeah, sorry he, to hear that. You, you pay yeah, a price. Yeah, he had all those quarters on shots now. That's right. You, you pay a price for this. You know, those of us who run into old footballers and you, 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 see, you see the limps... Mm. You know, and uh, especially, especially as, as Mina said, those cortisone injections, you, you're deceiving your body. You know, you're, you're forcing your body to think everything's right, and everything's normal when it's not. And obviously, mm. over, the long, over the long run, you pay a price for that. Listen, I'm really sorry to hear that because he's a really nice guy. From what you've told us uh, about, you know, the work he's done, even off the field as well, very sort of conscious guy, charity, charitably minded and everything like that. So I do wish him the best. Um, great player. And, and, of course, absolutely brilliant player as well. Gave us many happy moments. Um, you, you're going to have to declare an interest here, Mina, because um, Kevin in Aberdeen says, the World Football phone-in is definitely more interesting when Mina um, is on with her views in panache. You, don't just say, oh. I was waffling. <laughs> uh, who, who, who is this, Kevin? A really nice person. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, apart from that, I was thinking, how do you know? Are you asking me if I've paid people to call in? No, you wouldn't pay people. You're not that kind of a person. But obviously, he's he's your biggest (laughs) fan ever, you know, like... She's so cheap. She get him to do it for free. Yeah, (laughs) hopefully he's not your biggest fan in in that kind of stand way. Yeah, Darren is with us there in London. Good morning. Um, Hi, Don. Hi, you're right, Darren. Yeah, uh, I just want to wish uh, you, Tim and Mina, um, a Merry Christmas as well. That's very nice of you. I appreciate that. Yeah, absolutely. 
Um, I've got a question for Mina. Oh, do. so you didn't just want to wish us, ah, oh, there you go. <laughs> for one moment, I'm thinking, that's nice. You caught it all this way just to wish us Merry Christmas, but actually, you want to talk to Mina. Okay. Do you want to declare an interest again, Mina? <laughs> Sorry, Darren, just go ahead. Just man, ask his question. Yeah, of course, I will do. Darren? Uh, um, hi, Mina. Hi. Um, I just, um, first of all, I just want to say you're my favourite um, expert on the show as well. Oh, for goodness Oh, sake. thank you. God. By the way, I kind of need this. I've, I've had a rough three months. <laughs> OK, <laughs> go on. Fair enough. Well done, Darren. You've cheered her up. Well done. Um, I just want to ask you, um, do you think Gasparini of Atalanta would actually be an ideal manager for the Italian national team in terms of what the players they've got? Because when you look at the Italian team now... It's not like the normal type of team they have. Like it's like it's not really full of veterans or players in their early thirties. It's actually apart from Benucci, he's probably the only thirty year old who'll probably get in the starting uh, lineup now. It's like yeah, full of true. like it's like full of young players and players of like Verratti and Insigne. I think they were what, mid twenties, both of them. Um and when you look at like Don Maruno, who's only what, eighteen Oh, you could have a yeah. back a back three or Romagnoli, Caldara and Regani as well. And players like Conte and Bernadeschi as well. And and with his, um, he, he's doing so well at um, Atalanta. Do you think he'd be the ideal person to take over? That's a really great question. Um, and also, you, you have great knowledge of the, of the, of the uh, Italian side that's coming up. Caldara, I think, is especially one that would benefit from him, you know, from Gasparini. You're right, actually, because the veterans, you know, obviously De Rossi and now Buffon and Barzali have all, you know, announced the fact that they've they that they're retired from the Italian national team, and you've got all these young kids coming across. And Conte is another one, and he's presided over just this great time at at Atalanta, and obviously they beat Everton. They're doing so well in the Europa League. The thing about Giampiero Gasparini is that he needs time to really, and, and, and a lot of time to teach players. I mean, he is one of those coaches who, you have coaches who just rely on your experience or your knowledge of the game and, and, and perfect it, you know, like an Ancelotti. Or you have, um, you know, your motivators, the guy who's going to make you know how to win it. But Gasparini is really a teacher. He actually tells you how to move on the pitch what you should be looking out for, how you can stay one step ahead, um, or, or, you know, if you're a defender, where to stand. He he needs time. And the reason why he is so good at what he does at Atalanta and why he did is, firstly, he started off that career really badly, actually, with Atalanta. He was losing match after match. And credit to the president of keeping faith with him and believing in his ideal and believing that it just takes a little bit of time for him to find his feet, to get the players on board, and then he can start creating a masterpiece. And you know what? He kept faith with him. And Atlanta, as you as you mentioned, have been terrific. But this is, again, where I think the problem lies. I don't know necessarily, because he's always been so good with youth and he's always trained youth, um, that I'm not entirely sure how good he is when it comes to big egos and champions. And I know you're saying that Italy doesn't have that many of them. But if you look at it, Verratti is the sort of champion. He is with PSG, is this kind of a star. Insigne is a big star at Napoli. You, like you say, there's Bonucci, there is Claudio Marchisio, there is Immobile, who's just doing terrific work, and Belotti up front. And I don't know whether he can necessarily get them to buy into his ideas because it is a very exhaustive style of play that he likes to play. And it works very well when you have youngsters who are willing to run their socks off for you to try to impress you, to try to progress their career, knowing that if they listen to everything Gasparini says, they can use Atalanta and indeed his teachings as a stepping stone to something bigger. But when it comes to the national team, this is where the problem lies, because that is the final step. That is everything that an Italian player wishes to do, is reach the Azzurri, reach to playing for the, that team. And as we've seen, when it comes to when it came to him, he was in charge at Inter and sacked. I mean, admittedly, he wasn't offered very much time, but it was very hard for him to convince certain players, and big players really, to buy into his ideals. And he might not necessarily have that part of his character to really demand or, or know how to talk to players in the same way that, say, Ancelotti is, who is favoured by every single person in Italy and who, who everyone really wants to be that. But when it comes to, I think, he's better positioned to stay with a team like Atalanta 
to keep providing sort of the next generation of people that we should be looking at. Um, because certainly, if you look at Frank Essie, just players like Oa and Conti, who went to Milan, they're just they're doing terrific work. And Caldera will go to Juventus tomorrow. And that's all, you know, these are all players that um, have benefited from Gasparini and, and more, you know, Diego Milito at the time as well. So he is sensational, but I think he's better placed at a smaller club. Um, do you, who do you think will be the next manager of the Italian national team? Because when I look at it, I, I can't see the FA paying Conte the type of money he's currently getting, or probably even after salary he's getting at Chelsea. Ancelotti looks like he's more into club football instead. Mm. And the thing with Allegri, I know he said he wants to manage it one day, but I think when he leaves uh, Juve, I could see him doing maybe one more big job in Europe before he goes to the national team. So yeah, if, I agree with you. So if all those three and 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 not they've probably got no choice in them who do you think the FA will probably go for well obviously they they keep trying to beg Ancelotti to take it but like you said he wants to do club football two people who really do want it are Ranieri and uh, Mancini I think they would just absolutely love the opportunity uh, of course another ideal option would of course be Luciano Spalletti he's a tremendous tactician but he's doing such good work with Inter that it's I mean, I can't see him leaving unless, of course, you know, they they manage to convince him and to somehow get, Die, you know, um, Diego Simeone. And then that way they, they don't feel like they're losing, but it seems impossible. But he would probably be the actual ideal candidate for me, even better than Ancelotti would be Spalletti. Um, so, and you're right, Conte costs too much money and I don't think he wants to come back. And the reason why Ancelotti won't accept it as well is because he doesn't trust the direction that Italian football is going in. He wants to see who's going to take over, who's going to be president of the FA, whether they're going to start implementing, you know, whether they're going to start modernizing and accepting the fact that they are a little bit stuck in the dark ages and how and with a clear strategy of moving forward. But, I mean, you never know. I, I think there's a good chance Roberto Mancini could end up being there if, if they can't find anyone that they really want. Do you think Mancini would be good enough, though, for it? Do you think oh, the fans man. would be happy with it? <laughs> I don't think he's a bad coach. I don't think he's the best coach. I think that he might be a stopgap, if that makes sense, just someone who can take over, who can do well enough and who commands enough respect. Um, he certainly has great experience and it's not like he hasn't won anything but it's it's really hard at the moment to get somebody like an Allegri um, who has just who, who did such tremendous work with Juventus and who's been coveted by all the best teams in Europe as well as you know I really I, I'm interested to see whether or not they can convince Spalletti again if he continues to do as well as he's doing Mancini isn't good enough, but really, what are the options at the moment? Unless they decide to go for Ranieri, but they've actually held off from speaking to them. So it looks like they're just waiting to see whether they can create a good enough plan to convince one of the big boys to come in. Yeah, Darren, good questions. Really appreciate the call as well. So let's stick to the uh, the footballing questions, if you don't mind. Well, after this one, Tim, uh, who, who, who do you think that the Pope supported, Pope John Paul II? Which team did he support? Uh Vizsla Krakow. No, no, it was the Saints. <clears throat> um, yeah. God, I put yeah. that one on the penalty yeah. spot yeah. for you, mate. Yeah. Anyway, Danny he wanted to be I in that it was number. an actual question. <laughs> yeah, it was Southampton. Danny Manchester says, enjoying the festivities, especially the excellent standard of refereeing tonight. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, can Tim share any thoughts on Gabriel Heinz's appointment, Gabriel Heinz's appointment at Velez manager and if he has a defined style? I met Heinz when he... Uh, when he ooh, did something at Manchester United, it was an absolute delight when he was at Manchester United, I suppose. Yeah, yeah I'll be very interested to see how he goes. And Vélez uh, are an interesting club, um, not one of Argentina's traditional big clubs, but they kind of became big for a while, but, um, kind of in the 90s and going into uh, up to about five or six years ago. Um, a really well-run club who, who have fallen on, on, on hard times recently and have become very much a, a, a selling club. Um, so I think the expectations there aren't particularly high, and hopefully they'll give him time to do something, because that's the thing that really holds back. You know, listening to, to Mina talking about 
the Italian coaches or ever, uh, and with, with defined ideas of play and defined philosophies, you can only do that if, you, if you've got a club behind you that gives you time to put those ideas in, 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 in action. I think as a general rule in football, it works when the club, the institution, supports the team. And so often in South America, we have exactly the opposite case. The, the team supports the institution. The, the team has to win on Saturday in order to, to, to stop a, a political problem inside the institution. So everything is totally unstable. You know, three defeats and you're out. And it's really hard in those kind of circumstances for a coach to develop uh, his own line, his own way of doing things, because there's so little tolerance for that bedding in period that you need in order to, to implant something new. And I think that's something which has really held back the development of, uh, of, of lots of coaches o over here. It's when, you know, we were talking earlier on about the dynamism of ideas being much, much stronger in Europe than it is in South America. And I think that's one of the reasons, even though, and you're clearly seeing in Europe now, uh, a, 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 a desire to sack coaches far too quickly over there as well. I mean, what's just happened to uh, Eduardo Berizzo uh, at, at Sevilla is, is a disgrace, I think. You know, he's just, no, all right, he's just come back from a cancer operation. But, you know, even forgetting that the, the humanitarian grounds, he's qualified Sevilla for the Champions League. You know, they've got Champions League games coming up and they've just sacked him because they've lost two or three games on the bounce in the Spanish League. An That's absolute disgrace. How can a coach with that, that kind of job insecurity is absolutely terrible for, for football. Now, Mina made the point earlier on, just before the news, about the importance of a coach. I think she, she put it at 65%. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, the coach, look at Brazil. Now, under Dunga, they were sixth in World Cup qualification. New coach takes over, basically the same players, and they put together 10 wins and two draws. The, you know, the, the main thing that has changed there is the coach and the idea that's come from the coach. What does the coach do? He does three things. He picks the team, he selects the strategy, and he sets the emotional tone for, for, for the work that, that goes on. It's only three tasks, but it's very, very important tasks. And he needs some kind of job security in order to do that. If, if you, 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 you're in an environment when it's three defeats and out, he has no breathing space to develop his own style. As, as outrageous as the way the uh, Sevilla coach was treated, arguably in South America, or at least in Argentina, with the case of Independiente, it's more scandalous there where the coach is forced out by thugs. Yeah, uh, Ariel Holland. Now, this is a coach we were talking about earlier on. He's come from field hockey. Uh, he's brought some really good ideas with Independiente. They've just won the equivalent of the Europa League. It's their first international title for for seven years. Ariel Holland is an Independiente fanatic himself. You know, he loves the club. He's, he's been a fan of the club. He's been a paid-up member for years and years and years. So, But he, he's just quit. Uh, and uh, why has he quit? Because the organised groups of thugs who live off football in this part of the world, it's their profession, it's what they do, uh, they were uh, surrounding his family with threats. His family had, had, to, uh, had, had to walk around with bodyguards and so on. In the end, he just got tired of it and he quit. Now, why are they putting this pressure on him? To extort money. It's as simple as that. You give us money and we'll go away. And there was a Brazilian coach, Mauricio Ramalho, who was coach of Sao Paulo for a while, and he was talking about uh, there was a time when at Sao Paulo he had a player there that the organised groups of thugs, they didn't want him in the team. So that they went in, they, you know, they crashed into the training ground uh, and, uh, and sat down with him and said, uh, you know, we don't want this player in the team, but if you give us money, we'll, we'll chant his name. That's, you know, uh, and, and these organised groups of thugs, it's no surprise that, that they've branched out into, into serious criminal activity. Mm. Uh, and and this, this is an absolute disgrace, and it's a cancer inside South American football. Um, which, where which arguably you, you, starts you need... at the very top. When you consider the yes. two ex-FIFA members who were convicted in the United States of what the judge over there describes as mafiosi behaviour. Yeah, that, that, that's a different type of crime, although it's a very serious type of crime. And what, what they've done, this is the, the union between the, 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 rise, the, the, the huge rise of cable TV and, and the football tournaments. So suddenly you, you've got a new market and, 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 uh, and lots of tournaments were invented or brought back or expanded um, because it was great for cable TV that needed product for all of these hours. Um, so the, the, uh, the, these football officials were selling the rights on the cheap 
So the huge profits being made by, by uh, people in, uh, who make doing uh, intermediation of the media rights in return for bribes and kickbacks going back. So that's, that's a different type of crime, but it's another reason for South American football operating below its potential. Yeah, do you remember Amadeep? Amadeep was one of the guests at the 20th anniversary I do. special. I do remember him yeah. well. Do you remember which team he supports? Uh, no, I don't. No. Uh, well, if I sing, "Here it is, Merry Christmas, everybody's having fun." Uh, Were you a fan of Wolverhampton Wanderers? He is, yeah. I, was, I only did that to hear the accent. He's a Wolves fan. He's great. He's a fan of Wolverhampton Wanderers. <laughs> okay. He's a Wolves fan. You're absolutely magic, right. In magic they are. Wolves. I, I have interviewed Noddy Holden. He sounded I couldn't just like do that. It for the whole, I, no, honestly, yeah, I couldn't I did, do it for the whole two hours. No, Noddy was such a nice Slips. bloke. I interviewed him in an office that I think was... Opposite Selfridges or something like that. I seem to remember years and years ago. Is it any wonder they weren't successful in America and I wouldn't understand a word they I say? Did, I did ask him about that. I did ask him. You have to ask him about that moment. Anyway, I'm a Wolves fan, says Amadeep. As you'll be aware, we are having a wonderful season and currently leading the championship by four points. A We're a Brazilian tab- doing very well. Yeah, indeed. Coming on to that in a moment. Indeed. A certain tabloid newspaper has even suggested that we are the best side to have ever played in the second tier of English football. Wow. Needless to say, I'm enjoying this season thoroughly. However, as our promotion becomes more likely, I've begun to think possibly prematurely about next season. My concern is that once a promotion has, uh, has occurred, we'll become at best a mid-table side aiming for eighth, just another Stoke City or West Bromwich Albion. I wouldn't sniff at that, mate. Uh, the prospect no. of European football is remote for many sides in the Premier League, so ultimately every season will become about avoiding relegation. The future of club football in England appears to be four enormous clubs vying for a title, four very big clubs trying to make it to the Champions League with the rest of us fighting for air. Is it the same in the respective mm. regions of our experts? I'd like to wish all the team at Up All Night, all contributors and listeners across the globe a Merry Christmas, Happy New Year. So his question is, is it the same you. in your respective regions? We'll find out from you in just a moment. But first, hey, we've got a first-time caller with us, haven't we? Is that Chris in Yeovil? Yeah, hello, mate, all right? I'm very well, thanks very much. So how long have you been listening to the programme? Probably 12 years. So, and this is since the first you, time you've called you know, it? Since, yeah, genuinely. I've phoned your the, um, thing on Saturday nights a couple of times. Yeah, OK, but the yeah, virtual so I've never called it. I listen to this re- religiously every week, yeah. honestly. <laughs> and it's, it's, it's the first time I've decided to phone up tonight because he's on about the managers. Yeah, yeah. And great players, and that really got me buzzing because... There has been some great players and managers like Kenny Dalgleish. You can go back and start looking at people like that. But mm. in the modern era, I think Patrick Vieira could be the man to, mm-hmm. you know, really elevate that as a great player turning into a manager. Because he's could... doing it really quietly out in America, isn't he? That's right. That's right. Um, I heard... just wondered what you I guys heard... thought about it, really. I heard Tim murmur there. But Mina, first of all... Um, Patrick yeah. Vieira from the French leagues over to Arsenal, worked to Man City. Could he be the great player of his generation in modern times to become a great manager, do you think? Mina? I, well, he's got, a good, he's got as good a chance as any. Um, and I think, you know, again, he comes from, he, he was a great midfielder. He had great vision, so that gives him a helping hand. He's obviously doing well, and he's learning and allowed to make mistakes. So that's, I think, huge. I don't know why. I don't... Look, put it this way. I thought Clarence Adolf was a better midfielder, not that they were necessarily the same. But And obviously, he, he, he had the chance to be a coach, albeit very briefly at the time of Milan. And I think there were problems that he suffered. Sometimes, you know, if you are very good in what you do, it becomes very hard for you to relate to players who perhaps aren't as good as you or who don't grasp instructions or understand what to do in the way that you did when you were a player. I think that's why some of the best ever players really struggled to to become good coaches. It's just learning how to communicate and learning to understand that certain players just aren't or will never be yeah. as good as you. Or that, it's, that it's about teaching. That apparently was Glenn Hoddle's problem. Apparently, you know, allegedly that was his problem that he thought, you know, why can't you do this? I can do it. But Patrick oh, yeah. Vieira has allowed a, a period of time between his career 
and taking up management. As in, I wonder if that makes a difference because he probably can't do some of the things he used to be able to do anymore. And also, why is it that somebody like Patrick Vieira, who was a footballer under Arsene Wen- Wenger, probably, you know, arguably after Sir Alex Ferguson, the greatest manager of his generation? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And, and still is not able to you know, to give you the confidence, Mina, that he could have picked up things that would put him into that category in the same way that you would have expected some of Manchester United's golden era to have picked up from Alex Ferguson. Why is it that you're still not confident? What is it about Patrick Vieira that you're not confident about that he could become a great manager? Largely almost because I don't believe that if you are a very great player, you'll necessarily make a great manager. I still yeah, think I that you need to almost be mediocre as a player to become a great manager. I, I feel like there are exceptions. Obviously, we've noted Cruyff. We've noted different, you know, but I feel like when you are at the very top of your game as a player, which Patrick Vieira was, he was one of the very best, it becomes harder for you to become a great manager. I know that there are exceptions to this rule, but that part of me will always believe that it'll, it'll, there's going to be a little bit of a disconnect. I like the ones who who tend to have not have had a glittering career because deep down inside they were always tacticians. I've never seen Patrick was more of a guy who was gifted, who understood the game, but perhaps not someone who necessarily had to work on on changing or improving certain weaknesses within him, which is why I'm not that confident. Chris, Chris. and but yeah, it is it is training different under different coaches. There's a huge thing, of course. That's a good answer though, as well. Really, that makes a lot of sense, you know. Yeah, but we're going to get Tim's. Like we're going to get Tim's point of view as well. And Tim, remember when yeah, you said there'll be no sense there. No, no, there will be because remember when you said earlier the three things a good coach needs to do: select the team, yeah, and blah 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 blah. But let's do <laughs> yeah. the select the team first of all. <laughs> the thing that might not give me confidence is that when he was, you know, director of football or whatever he was in Man City. You know, they struggled still, didn't they? Yeah, that's true. That was when Mark Hughes was there, wasn't it, I think? Yeah, and then a little bit after that as well. OK, they might have won. There's the no, but there's no such thing as success without failure. I don't believe in it. Mm. I don't believe in success without failure. Without it going wrong somewhere, that's where you learn. That, that, that's Mina's point about the, the mediocre player because he's failing. The mediocre player is failing to be a great player and has to, has to compensate yeah. by thinking more about it. But my question now to Mina is... What's the route now? In, in, in terms of, say, English football, there used to be a route, like, say, Brian Clough. You do your apprenticeship at your Hartley Pool or someone like that, and you work your way up. Nowadays, is experience picked up at a Hartley Pool necessary or relevant? I mean, the, the, the two great players who we've got... Now, for me, Guardiola was a great player. Uh, yeah. He was a thinker. He was, he was a coach while he played. But yeah. he he was great, and if you gave him space, he would rip you to rip you to pieces from uh, from a deep lying position. He, but he really understood the game as well. I was at Wembley in '92 when Barcelona won the uh, the, the the Champions League as, as now is for the first time. And he was the kid, but he had so much importance in that side in balancing out that side. Uh, and I've I've been a fan of Guardiola ever since. But anyway, Zidane and Guardiola. Both of them served a little bit of an apprenticeship with their, their respective B-sides. Um, what do you think now for... And, and Vieira has, has gone to the States to pick up experience there. What do you think... And obviously one side doesn't fit all, this is, this is all relative. But what do you think, Mina, is, is for, some, for someone who's a top player who's just retiring now, what path do you think he, he, he should go about mm-hmm. in order to prepare him for, for the top jobs? Are we discussing about England? Are we? Di- so you said it to do with English football because I think it actually well, you're, depends you're on the country. Really. Yeah. Well, anyway, really, it, isn't it? Yeah. yeah I guess it, it, there is an importance where you need to learn about the the league that you want to play in. I think actually, I think international experience is one of the most important things. I think going out to different countries and understanding or, or learning under different tacticians just. Conte is simply at the time when he was learning how to be a coach, would visit different coaches, play, uh, you know, tacticians who played different formations and in different countries just to see the setup. He wanted to see how 
people in England would train, you know, what, what made their training that much different on a physical level to what they did in Italy. He would train, he looked at the way that Ventura, incidentally, who was the sax manager of Italy, how he decided to play a 4-2-4 formation. He studied under different things. I think that's important. Retiring, I think you need to then go into collecting your coaching badges. I think that's important. But I do think like Zidane working under Ancelotti, if you are to use this example, is important for his growth because you'll notice a lot of the times they used to discuss things on the sidelines, such as, for example, why Ancelotti would, against Atletico Madrid opted to to um, rotate his fullbacks, you know, out on a tactical level, why he chose to change them rather than change the forward line when they weren't scoring goals. And that would help him change the way that, you know, how he looked at the game and how he he moved along. I think that's important for you to work under good coaches, you know. Andre, Andre Villas-Roas did, of course. He trained under some of the best, obviously in different capacities at the time. But I think for me that that would work really well. But you need to understand your particular league. And, and, if, you, and, and if you are wanting to be, for example, if your dream is to be the coach of, I'm going to just say Roma for a second, or Valencia, you can't just pick anyone because those particular clubs come with a lot of pressure. So to be a successful manager for those clubs requires actually a different type of, of understanding and experience because you have to understand how to ensure the team block out outside noise and focus on their football, how to just separate themselves from the external pressure of the city, from the demands of their fans, and just focus on keeping it simple and playing their football. And I think to be a successful coach for certain teams, you also need to handle that. You, football is growing so rapidly, and now it's on such a big stage. You need to understand politics, how to communicate. You know, like, let's just look at Rafa Benitez. He, he, was, he is an exceptional tactician, doesn't necessarily knew, know at the time how to communicate with certain players, didn't necessarily do a very good job of communicating with presidents when he got sacked from Inter at the time. It's about encompassing all of that, and I think you need to learn that as well. So it's almost intelligence, but you have to have general intelligence as well. Uh, Chris, do you feel browbeaten now? No, no, it made a lot of sense. But also, I was just thinking what Tim was saying about success without failure. That's exactly the same thing that happened to Alex Ferguson. He was just yeah. one game away from the sack, from the sack yeah. and he won the FA Cup, and then look what happened, like, you know? Absolutely amazing. But, the but fundamental... this is what I used to say with, with Cruyff. You know, he came very close to a time, you know, when we talk about him. He's, and I used to say, oh, I don't know, because he needed, you know, that was that important match in the Copa del Rey and Real Madrid had a player sent off and, and that was when he won it and, yeah. and won a title and, sorry, won a trophy and was allowed time to continue implementing his philosophy. But you never know right. what happens if Real Madrid had won that though, match. That is how it should be as well to build a team that's going to last as well, you know. And I wonder yeah, whether you need time. I wonder whether Patrick Vieira has gone to. And I apologise to all the Americans listening, but what we would regard as maybe a footballing backwater to make his mistakes yeah. before coming back to Europe, you know, in the same way that uh, Tim was talking about, you know, going off to Hartlepool or wherever it might be. Yeah. And apologies to all fans of Hartlepool as well. But you know, go off to some. Even if they did hang a monkey. <laughs> those, 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 in the days of when we didn't know what Frenchmen looked like, okay? In those yeah. days. In those days. Yeah. I mean, imagine, yeah, no, no. imagine, that's the funny thing. Whenever you read Shakespeare, whenever you read Shakespeare, you're thinking, hang on, you've set this in Vienna, or not, not Vienna, in Rome, or Vienna, or uh, you've set it in wherever it might be. Um, and Verona, Verona, I was thinking Romeo and Juliet, and nobody, none of your audience knows what an Italian even looks like. As far as they're concerned, they, the Italians could look like monkeys as far as you're concerned, but yet somehow, yet somehow they've got a sort of like kind of put in their minds that this monkey fell in love with this other monkey and it still, it still makes sense to us. Do you know what I mean? And well, I, yeah, because two monkeys make... 
another one, and away you go, isn't it? That's well, it yeah, is. in a way, we are all monkeys, in a way. Mm-hmm. And, you know, That's if you right. look at it from one point of view or another, or crocodiles, it's I don't know what it is. We all come, yeah. Yeah. I, yeah, I think there are more monkeys than crocodiles, really, yeah. Well, talking of crocodiles, you know, I've got to... <laughs> there are two opportunities for me to link this to a rock and roll tune. Uh, I can either go down the Elton John route... The Elton John. ..or yeah. the Bobby yeah. Charles, before you say Bill Haley, the original was by Bobby Charles. Uh-huh. Crocodile. Yeah. Oh, well, sh- should we allow should we allow Mina to choose? Yeah, go on then. Elton John or Bobby Charles stroke Bill Haley in the comments, Mina. Elton John. <laughs> she said that tentatively. Yeah. Look, no, you, you prefer the, you prefer the, alligators to crocodiles. Oh yes, yeah, yeah. I forgot alligators, crocodiles. What's the difference? <laughs> the one thing I can say about that crocodile rock. Bony, aren't they? Do, do you know, bony when you eat them. The one thing that really cheeses me off about crocodile rock used to be one of my favourite tunes. But there is this. But when I became when I was twelve years old, it was one of my favourite tunes. Then by the time I became seventeen, I actually knew this beautiful girl who went and left us for some foreign guy. And that cheesed me off, you know. It was an Italian, of course. And uh, it, it wasn't even my girlfriend. It wasn't, I, I know, it wasn't even my girlfriend. It was my mate James's girlfriend. This girl, uh, well, uh, her name was Suli. Let me leave it at that. And um, well, so. a beautiful girl, and and she went and left him for some foreign guy. And then you're thinking, oh, my, what, those are the lyrics of the song. Gosh, Susie went and left us for some. Her name was essentially Susie. But we called her Sue. You know. Went and left us for some. I know. Well, it, all, 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 all easy on the language, though. No, you know, you don't use that language, you know. And I know. No, I, know I, I, I know. I know. I know. I know. I Chris. Chris. I, I. I know you didn't mean it. I it was yeah, I, I know. Yeah, no, that's fine. You're a gentleman for apologising. Well done, you. Anyway, thank you. Merry Christmas, mate. Merry Christmas. And, Merry Christmas. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, brrr, gosh, it's always a balancing act, isn't it? That you know, you balance very precariously sometimes when you want to open up the conversation. Lots and lots of conversation about the Pope uh, keeping goal for Krakow, <laughs> and uh, yeah, uh, apparently there was no way he was ever a Whistler fan, as Tim suggested. Whistler. No. Yeah, Vizsla Krakow. Vizsla, Vizsla, oh, Vizsla. 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 Yeah. yeah, the two clubs really, really don't like each other as the local derby is known as the Holy War, which is quite uh, apt, as seeing as uh-huh. it's Christmas, he says. Anyway, all the best for 2018 to you all, and a big yeah. shout-out to the gent, says Marky Morkin. Yeah, it's very, Indeed. very kind of you. I'm sure the gent will appreciate that as well. Uh, Rude Hullet couldn't manage because he couldn't understand uh, the... Trials of less talented players, says one of our listeners. Is that a problem for him, do you think? Either of you? Trials Certainly Alan Ball said it, it, was, it was a problem for him, for, for Alan, you know, the late, great Alan Ball during his managerial he career. He went to Southampton he to manage, that, was it Southampton that he managed? Yeah, he, did, he did Man City, uh, okay. and, he, and he said that uh, one of the things that really held him back was that lack of patience for players who, A, didn't have the same talent that he, that he did, and B, didn't have the same motivation. And he found it very difficult to, to get through to them. Well, this was said about Zlatan Ibrahimovic. He said that, you know, he would really struggle to play alongside other footballers who he just didn't understand why they didn't get it or why they just weren't good enough. And so he would shout at them and yell at them. And sometimes he had to be told by his coaches that not everyone was as good or as gifted as he was. And everybody was as sexy as he was. Remember sexy football? Yeah, but I mean, it's something so simple if I'm going to translate it into home life. Have you ever tried to teach your mum or dad how to use, like, the computer or or, or like a mobile phone? No, I did try it and is... teach my grandma to suck <laughs> It didn't work either. <laughs> it I bought, is really I bought exactly like that when they don't... Ever... <laughs> Bought my first ever iPhone um, smartphone this week, uh, and uh, I'm exactly like that. <laughs> first no, uh, ever. I, I couldn't even answer it. Yeah, yeah. What do you mean? What did I you couldn't have answer it. Well, I just had little like Nokia type things, and that's all I wanted. No, but I, no, I left, no. When I was when I was in, in in England a couple of weeks ago, I left it in the day of all the snow. I got a bit stretched, and I left it in my mum's house. And I can't. So I came back without a mobile. So I thought this is finally the moment I've got to do it. So you know, do you know my it, stepdaughters have to help me. They have to help me like, is, answer it because you don't you don't just press a button. You have to kind of swoosh to the side. 
You know, it's so the modern world <laughs> is so complicated. Did they want to kill you at one point for trying to teach you how to do it? No, they just they, they just want to laugh at me. I think. Of course they the do because this is your moment when you put down the brick of a telephone that you used to have, <laughs> and then you join the, the modern exactly, life. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. For goodness' sake! But I'll, I'm not going to spend my entire life looking downwards. Of course like, you are. You no, know, I'm, I'm not doing it. Of course you're. It's not now, going to happen. That's I'm what they all say I'm glad you told us this, so you can't hide from us anymore. When we send you an email, we know that you've got you it. That it. You, haven't had to, you haven't had to switch on your computer to go down to some, you know, computer, yeah. what do they call it? You know, I'm, internet I'm not, I'm cafe. Not doing that yet. Yeah, I'm you don't have to go down yet. to the internet cafe anymore to get our emails. So you're back you're back on terra firma. I'm glad to hear that. Listen, a couple of thoughts though about football managers, etc. Sam Allardyce, player and manager, says Richard. Uh, very good point as well, I suppose. Uh, also, yeah, this one... Not a great player. He was, he was a lumbering yeah, centre-back. He was, he was, he was, he was. He was, he was. Who had to think about was, it yeah, and has thought was. about it, obviously, a lot. This, this from Brian. He says, um, in your regions, I wonder if you could tell me who the oldest ref in your regions is. I'm 80, 8 zero, and still <laughs> refereeing. Merry Christmas to everybody. Blimey. That ain't bad, is it? That's extraordinary. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that is extraordinary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He yeah. doesn't well, say they which have, level. They have to retire. The, the, the professional refs, they yeah, have yeah, to retire now very obviously. early, yeah, really. Yeah, he's not professional. No, obviously, you know. Yeah. But maybe, you um, know. You know rev- is it something like 40, what, 47 or something 47 like that? 47 the that, oldest uh, that, that, in, in South something America? Something like that, that they, they, have to, they have to retire at. And, and what about in, uh, in Europe? A- anybody older than about 47? You know? Anyway, can you think of anything? Uh, I mean, yeah, it is 47, right? No, they tend yeah, to be I younger. See, I, I think I, I Martin Mina. Atkinson. Huh? Sorry. I wonder, Mina, if, if the, the video ref will provide employment opportunities for refs who've passed that limit of 47, because I'm sure they've got lots of experience and, lot, and you know, it, it would be a shame to lose all of that. So the video ref position where they don't have to run around, they can just sit yeah. in front of the screen. Yeah. That yeah. could well, be something Unless they're a bit like you where for... they're not really into technology. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Good point. <laughs> dear, dear, Good point. Dear, dear, well made. Dear, dear, dear. <laughs> of course it's well made. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, I guess if they don't have to run around and they can just watch the video and, and for, for VAR reasons, then that might be a good... Yeah, why not? Is the it... average age in, 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 what is it, in Italy is just under 40. I think Germany's like 35. Mm. Yeah. Well, the Germans it it like... means if you want if you want a career, if you want to make that your career, you've got to start really early. You know, it's no good waiting, you know, getting reaching 30 and thinking, well, I'm not going to be a player. I might as well start a refereeing career yeah, course, because by yeah. the time you've qualified, yeah. it's, it's time to retire. It's too late, yeah. Pete says, this is Pete, sent me an email. Pete in Massachusetts says, um, decade plus listener here, an occasional emailer. I love the show. I have two questions from both pundits, if I may. I know Mina loves Francesco Totti and he was a great player, but I wonder if his <laughs> big personality, <laughs> importance and dressing room presence held the team back in some ways. What does she think? And can either pundit think of any great player from their regions who were hugely important to their teams but may have held those teams back as a result? Mina? Well, yeah, I think so. I think uh, he was a great player. He's a great symbol. Hello? Yeah, and held everybody back uh, in the dressing room. Oh, sorry. I thought there was like a little noise. No, so I thought no, you might no, have just connected. No, no. Yeah, we were but thinking. I think that, that was he us was thinking, almost... grinding the thought together. Hmm. So I feel like sometimes he was too big and there was, you know, a lot of commotion created because of his fallout with uh, Luciano Spalletti. His wife started doing interviews about it in which she she labelled him a few names that weren't very pleasant. And and just creating that kind of atmosphere in Roma, which is a very difficult club anyway to manage because, like I said, of external pressures. And then to have this huge symbol where everyone is crying every time he kicks a ball. It's like, yeah, we get it. He was great, you know, but, but surely like you, when you have a player who becomes so great that it, it all becomes about, is he going to start? Is he going to come on in the last of a game? When do we get to do a, you know, a standing ovation on all this? Then it almost overtakes the progress of a club. So I think Tim, there needs to be a certain age Tim, where you 
move on. Tim, what about South America? Lots it, of big personalities it, it, there as well. It would be Romario. Romario, little little man, big personality, yeah, yeah. and he would always look for privileges in, inside the dressing room. And people who, who, who would rival his status, he would cut them down to size. So Very it, difficult fella to, to get on with. To the benefit or to the d distraction of the team? Oh, to, to, the, to the detriment. To the detriment. detriment, yeah. To yeah. Total yeah. De de detriment. OK. Uh, thank you very much, guys. Here it is. Merry Christmas to you all. Thank you. Everybody's having fun, except us, of course, we're working. Mm -hmm. Mina, many thanks, and Tim too. BBC Five Live.